Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello, Denver ISSA members and other virtual attendees. Thank you for attending our another virtual event uh, for today, Tuesday, July 20, or not July, June 23rd. Who knows what month it is and day it is. I uh, appreciate you guys being here, being able to watch live in the event. Of course, we're going to keep these recordings available uh, for everyone to watch at a later time. So if you can't make this, uh, this meeting, of course, you can watch virtually anytime, any day. So what we have today is a really good speaker, uh, John Stock. Uh, he's worked for Outpost 24. He's going to speak with us about Internet of Things. And I think that's a, that's a big topic and how to secure things wirelessly and how we're starting to see a lot of things integrating into our networks from home into our environments. And what we've just created and opened up is possibly another access point through our doorbell or our video camera or refrigerator into our corporate networks. Uh, let's hope split tunneling is enabled on, on your uh, your VPNs. But I'm going to turn over to John Stock. He's worked for Outpost for 20, for 10 years. Uh, he's a senior uh, security consultant. He's a technology program director and a product manager, providing both uh, customer support as well as professional services and he even does some pen testing. So as prior to his role at Outpost 24, he spent 10 years working for one of the largest utility companies with roles as Windows System Minister, Network Engineer, and finally Senior Security Engineer. Uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science in Computer Systems and, engineer and, and Networks. So he's like me, Information Security Engineer. So give him a virtual clap and I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to John for some introduction. Share, share where you're at right now. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I'm over in the uh, the sunny UK where it's been the hottest day of the year, and I'm sat in a small little office with no air conditioning. So that's that's a joyous moment in my life that missing air conditioning in our lockdown. So um, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for the intro. Um, so yeah, uh, what I'm going to talk about is essentially um, securing connected devices, whatever those devices may be. Sometimes IoT, sometimes laptops. You know. They're all things, they're all on the internet, and they're all dangerous, um, and how we can prevent some of those, the wireless attacks associated with them. Um, before I kick off, I'll just give you a, a quick intro to um, who I work for, and I'll give you a quick one into me as well, even though you've already had a pretty awesome one. Um, so I work for our post 24. We are based here, which is a sunny place called Kolskrona in uh, Sweden. Um, we do full stack security assessments, so if you think of that as anything from um, vulnerability scanning to web application scanning, um, automated manual pen testing. Um, we have wireless security through our Pony Express acquisition last year. Um, we're all gone into the cloud and container side. So essentially we're looking at the full stack of security controls and you know how we can assess those and tell you how good or bad they are. Um, we've got about 2000 customers around the world that I spend a lot of time talking to and a lot of time getting really good ideas about things. Um, one of the things that we, we kind of pride ourselves on is we love breaking technology. Now, I'm um, a bit of a nerd. As anyone who can see, there's a nice big monitor behind me with far too much IT equipment behind it, and I'm just in this small office at home. Um, we love breaking technology. We love it. We love embracing it. But what's the point in embracing it if you can't break it, right? So um, one of the things we always kind of like to do is, you know, if we get new technology, we like to break it, pull it apart, see how it works, um, and then find out any security vulnerabilities in it. So you know, going back to my background, I've done everything from pen testing to um, yeah, what the social engineering side, which is always the most fun. Nothing like getting tea and biscuits when you're not supposed to be somewhere. Um, but also, yeah, the pen testing side is always great if you want to kind of see how something works. So, um, you know, we like playing with that technology and it's something that's kind of stuck with me through the years. Even as a product manager now where some of my friends say, oh, I've got a fluffy job now. Um, no technology involved. Fortunately, there is. I still get to do the nerdy stuff. Um, so, yes, we, we've been we've been going for around, well, uh, 2001, it's nearly 20 years. I'm going to go for nearly 20 years. Um, and, yeah, essentially, we are, we, are, we are looking at that full stack assessment and a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is kind of research we've done around that and things we've been looking at while we've been doing that testing and that work. So some of the key topics and things from today. So back in uh, February, when we were actually allowed to get on a plane and travel, which was kind of nice and I do miss it, um, but don't tell my wife, um, we kind of did some a survey when we were in um, 
RSA, San Francisco, around the Internet of Evil things, you know, what things are on the Internet, what people are worried about. Um, some of the wireless threats from bring your own devices and shadow IT. So essentially, people bring in their own stuff into work and using that instead of the corporate stuff they should be using. Um, well, actually, the device visibility is probably the most important thing. You can only secure what you can see, right? Um, implement, implementing some wireless detection into your security workflow because often it's missing. Um, and some takeaways, some just some ideas of things um, that that it's it's worth remembering and, and kind of trying to factor in your day to day lives when you when you're working and doing a, a real job. Um, I always like to put this one right at the beginning. I look at this from a business perspective simply because of the fact without a business, none of us have got jobs, right? If um, all the companies we worked for, if there was no business there, we wouldn't have jobs. We wouldn't be doing what we're doing. And sometimes it's hard to take security to the business and be able to be taken seriously. They just see it as, oh, you know, it's another pile of money that they have to spend every year. So I kind of look on this how to provide value to the business. Yes, there's the technology side and the technology side is really important to all of us guys. But also, you know, from the business side, you have to be able to present this stuff to the business and get some value from it. Otherwise, they'll stop giving you money and bad things happen. So just to start off, why are wireless technologies increasing our risk? So, we, you know, we're all, we've all got some sort of wireless technology in our lives, but why, why are they actually increasing our risk? So if you look at the traditional wired networks, now you get a nice English castle as well with some ducks on the bridge. Um, but you look at a traditional network, I will say a wired network, um, you have one way in, one way out of that network, and people consider everything inside to be trusted. So yeah, this probably hasn't been a fact for quite a few years now. We're probably looking at a little while. But yeah, everything inside is trusted and everything outside, that's the dirty, nasty, naked internet. It's the Wild West. We don't want any of that in here. But once you're inside, yeah, you're fine. It's it's. Yeah, well, we won't talk about Trojan horses, but uh, yeah, it's just the way the, the networks have been for a while that, you know, you've got the one way in, one way out, you know what's inside. Unfortunately, that's not true anymore. Wireless networks has literally turned our networks inside out. So yeah, what used to be inside is no longer inside. It's kind of inside and sort of outside. What used to be outside, you can kind of look in inside without actually being inside. So you kind of turned everything upside down on its head, upside down, back to front, inside out. It's not the same. So just going to give you a nice example. Um, four Russian spies, spies, um, because maybe nothing was ever proven. You never know. So allegedly spies. Um, they were caught outside the organiz Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, which is in The Hague in the Netherlands. Um, and this was recently after um, what happened in the UK in 2018. Um, I think it was early in the year in Salisbury. There was a, a Russian, ex-Russian intelligence guy that was poisoned and they disappeared and they poisoned him and people ran away. We got hold of the poison. It went to Portland Down and these guys to see if it was dangerous stuff. These guys basically tried to hack in. Uh, they may have been Russian or may not, but yes, they tried to hack in. And when they were caught outside the building... They opened the boot of the car and they found these things, smartphones, Wi-Fi panels, um, some computers, transformers, bag with battery, Wi-Fi, more Wi-Fi panels on the top. Um, and if you look through that stuff, you know, I would say there's maybe $500 worth of equipment from eBay there. Nothing, it was nothing sophisticated. You know, half this was you could have bought from eBay. Some of it you could have bought from um amazon you know there was nothing illegal there but when you take that mix it with some of their equipment then they actually were able to listen to the wireless networks outside they were they had a um a wi-fi pineapple there there was all sorts of little things and you know none of these things are illegal but they're, they're quite easy to buy and these guys were trying to use them to kind of stop some of the chemical weapon information that they may or may not have been using um in the uk to poison this is this 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 People who don't like Russia anymore. We'll put it that way. Um, and going back 10 years. So this one's 2008. Um, and one of the big um, credit card scams that you, everybody has literally heard of where people were war driving around, connecting to weak Wi-Fi and screaming off credit card details. Um, you know, it's one of those big hacks. That everybody said, oh, uh, oh, people are doing that, really? 
Um, and yeah, it kind of, at the time, it was quite a new new thing. But over the time, I think TJ Maxx was one of them. Um, there was various other places in the UK that got hit by people driving around, finding weak wireless and connecting into it and stealing data without any problems. It wasn't very difficult. But this is all back, you know, 2018, 2008. You know, it's all old stuff, right? No one does that anymore. Um, you think modern modern technology, we can fix that. So these are just a few things I found um, quite a little while ago, uh, maybe three or four months, so not that long. Um, so maybe we've got here, we've got a, a fake AirPods connecting to a phone from a Linux machine. It's not really AirPods, it's someone's laptop, but they're saying they are. Um, here, I think this one, we can actually see that there's getting out of the lock screen. You can tell what screen they're on. Um, you can actually see who they're dialing up here and various things that are going on with the phone without actually being in front of the phone. So and all that stuff is being broadcast out because of certain technologies to make our life easier, AirPods, I'm looking at you, um, and your AirPods or whatever you're connecting to know exactly what's going on in your phone. You're, if you've got a Mac, you know, you can now unlock your phone from your Mac and all these kind of great things. Um, but it has to be some interaction there somewhere. If someone can break in that, then somebody can do something with your equipment that you don't want them to, which is usually a bad thing. And yeah, we're quite OCD um, in our office. So I live in Plymouth, which is in the southwest of the UK. We have an office here. There's about 10 of us in the office. We're quite OCD about our wireless and our wireless security. And we don't want wireless things hanging around. But I did a quick um, scoot around the office just before the lockdown, in fact, looking for where's all the wireless things that we actually have in the office. And there we go. I sit in my office. I've got this nice lead um, Zeppelin speaker that I listen to all day and annoy everybody with my music. Um, guys in the office have a Sonos speaker, wireless, a couple of Raspberry Pis, scrolling messages about the temperature and that kind of thing. Some LED lights, wireless. Um, we love Lego and Star Wars, if you didn't guess. Um, lights underneath them, wireless. Um, the Canary security camera that we just have there because it looks it was fun to try and break. Um, wireless, the TV. Um, and I've got some more about TVs later, but yeah, the TV, big TV to um, do video conferencing on, um, wireless. Uh, the Xbox, that's definitely not under the TV because we only use the TV for video conferencing, not for the Xbox. Uh, wireless again. Uh, my headphones for my phone, wireless. The uh, headset that somebody's using in the office, wireless. So you can just see, just from a quick look around our office, there's all of these wireless devices around that. Yeah, some people are like, well, we haven't got much to wireless, but unbeknownst to us, there's all this wireless hanging around that yeah, has got to connect to somewhere or is waiting for someone to connect to it. So that was a long, short intro. Um, so essentially, when we're at RSA, we did this poll. There was um, a few over 200, actually. I think we should have upped that a little bit. But yeah, it was quite a few over 200 um, security professionals we spoke to during the RSA 2020 conference. Um, just to find out, you know, a little bit about their wireless security. Essentially, we wanted to know if they had confidence in what they have in their network, confidence in what's around them, um, the ability to recognize threats, and the ability to, once they recognize a threat, to actually respond to it. Because it's been all nice being able to go, oh, look, there's something bad, huh. and walk away. Hey, you can't do that. If you see something bad, you should go and stop it. So... You know, the first question, how confident are you at preventing a wireless attack? So, yeah, pretty much over half of the security professionals we asked were like, well, not really. Um, you know, why? Why? No, I can't. Yeah, most people were like, well, we probably could not prevent, confidently prevent a wireless attack if there was one on the network. So, yeah, we took that one a step further. and It's like, okay, why do you not think you could? Um, 61%. It said, well, actually, I think that's because too many bring your own devices, um, smartphones, laptops, tablets. Now, I've seen that as the, a pretty big perceived threat for a long time. A lot of people are worried about, you know, I'm, you know I walk into the office, so I've got my phone with me, I'm going to connect into the corporate network and do bad things. Um, you, know, you don't know how well my phone is. I could be running iOS 4 on it or something horrific, um, really old. You don't know that. It could be jailbroken. It could be backdoored. You don't know what sort of state that is. And I can understand why people are worried about that. Um, people bring in their laptops. I bring in my corporate laptop, I get set it into work, connects them to the corporate network. 
for some reason I'm taking in my personal laptop. Doesn't happen very often, but occasionally if I'm working late and I want to do some work on there as well, I'll connect into the guest network because I know the rules and I'd get in big trouble if I didn't. But not everybody does that. People are like, I've got the password for the corporate network. I'm just going to plug in there. I'm sure it's faster. It's usually not. Um, so yeah, that's the majority of people think, well, that's the biggest threat. But personally, from my, my experience, it's that 21%. It's those office IoT devices that are the biggest threat. Um, printers, smart TVs, vending machines, coffee machines, that kind of thing. You know, I'm running out of creamer for the, lav to, for the lattes. You're going to have to update me. Yeah, it used to be that a guy would come around and, and it's probably going to get even more so now, by the way, just things are changing. Um, so it used to be someone would come around, look at your vending machine and go, right, I need to clean this. I need to fill this up. Add some more coffee, add some more cups. That's it. I'll see you in six weeks. It disappear. Something runs out. Well, oh, it'll be back in four weeks. We can't have any more of that. Now that coffee machine will send a notification to say, this thing's running out of uh, whiteness. Someone needs to come here and service the machine or, you know, something needs to happen to it. And some guy will turn up and service a machine. Um, a couple of offices I've been to in London this year, the menus, if you want to see the menu for the restaurant, it's all in a nice digital whiteboard um, or a digital menu kind of thing. Um, you can look at it on your phone. You can look at it on your workstation. Yeah, all these ways of seeing what's for lunch that's connected to the network, usually via Wi-Fi. Um, and the big one, and I really like this one, was TVs. Now, a lot of people forget about the TVs, but you walk into your average office, there are TVs everywhere. You know, you look around um, conference conference rooms, there's a big 55-inch TV on the wall. Nearly all of them have got Bluetooth these days. Nearly all of them have got Wi-Fi these days. They get updated by Wi-Fi. If you're lucky, they get updated by Wi-Fi. Um, so it's, it's a lot of things. And that just another example from RSA was walking around, and I was... Um, had a wireless sniffing device, as you do, um, while I was wandering around and I had it running on our standard RSA. And I was picking up hundreds of TVs because every stand RSA, every vendor has a big TV and they're plugged into it and showing, you know, some latest marketing bump that they like to show us all and expose everyone to while you're there. But it's a TV that's broadcasting out on wireless and on Bluetooth and yeah, you know, I quite happily connected to the TV on our stand and, you know, started playing YouTube on the TV and then disconnected it before my boss caught me because that's bad, bad for career prospects. But you could do it. And it was there was no security on them. There was nothing. You just said, oh, I want to broadcast to this. So it's just a good example of all these things that people aren't necessarily thinking about when they're talking about IoT devices. They're thinking of the doorbells. They're thinking of the video cameras and things like that. But everything from your TV to your vending machines has also got some sort of internet connection. And the smallest one as well, it's also worth calling out, is IT devices like computers. Yeah, there's loads of them on the network. So most people aren't so worried about the con corporate control. But there's also the Wi-Fi routers that maybe someone's put in for a, another reason, say a, a, a small office, and I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute. But um, to which wireless threats? Um, present the greatest risk. So uh, just one thing I always notice is that whenever we ask this question, what threat, doesn't matter if we put wireless, what BYOD threat, what cloud threat, um, yeah, it doesn't matter what you say, password theft will always come out of the top. Doesn't matter what you say. Everyone is always worried about passwords being stolen. And I understand it. I completely understand it. Um, it it's a really bad thing to happen. And, you know, you get all your passwords compromised, you're in trouble. We all know people reuse them despite us telling them not to. Um, and the same with botnet and malware. You know, they're kind of really bad things we don't want. We're going to worry about. Um, so they're always going to be the top. But for wireless, one of the biggest things to worry about is always the man in the middle of the attack. And I'll talk a little bit more um, about it later on. Um, not too much later, you're pleased to know. But, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more. But more specifically for wireless, you know, the man in the middle attack is probably a pretty big risk, uh, especially as not everyone uses the latest and greatest when it comes to, to wireless security. You know, people put in a wireless network, a lot of wireless infrastructure, and that's a lot of money. So they're, they're stuck with it for five, six years until they do a technology refresh. You know, before they know two weeks after they put in now their new wireless network, bad things for their particular network came out as well. Um, and this was this was an interesting one. This is one that um, I actually had to go and ask a few people about while we were there. So 
when was the last time you checked wireless devices for known vulnerabilities? Well, 31% of people said, oh, last week. Yeah, I'm always doing it. We do it a lot. Um, and I'm like, really? Like your TVs and your vending machines? And oh, no, no, we, we automatically roll the updates out to our laptops every week. And so if there's any new wireless device, you know, wireless drivers for the laptop, they'll get rolled out. So it's it's that perception that, oh, because we're securing the endpoints, that people are secure. But in actual fact, they're not so secure because that's only taken into account a really small part of the wireless infrastructure that you have. It's only taken into part, account the part that's directly in front of you, not those bits that are in a meeting room that are, no one can see and no one's looking at right now. So next one, do you know how many devices are connected to your network? So I, I'm a big, big advocate of you can only secure what you can see. If you can't see it, you can't secure it. And it's a, it's a big one that a lot of people kind of agree with when you start talking to them and they're like, well, I know what I've got, so I know I can secure it. Then when you start talking to people a lot more, it's like, well, do you know everything you have? And they're like, well, I'm pretty sure. I think our marketing team might have a few things that they're, they've run up with this branding agency in Azure. And I think someone else has got something that they've been running up for our pension scheme up on uh, Google Cloud, but I'm not too sure. So you don't really know about everything. Well, I guess not. No. So it's all about understanding what you have. Um, no one's ever going to know 100%. I think we can get that out on the table now. No one knows 100% of what's on their network. Um, if someone says they know 100% of what's on their network, it's changed and they're wrong. It, it's quite a simple way of looking at it is you don't. It's, it's impossible. Um, you can have a good idea, but you can never know exactly. And yeah, it was good to see that at least half the people were aware that there's, it's pretty much impossible to have a good grasp of what's on your network. Um, the other one that's quite encouraging is actually people actually do realize that they need to do access to do more to look at for those access points of road devices on their network. So if you look at your network, you know what's on there. Um, and you, you think you know what's on there anyway. And you've got a good idea. You know what should be there, where you've got access points. But unfortunately, people often want to make their life easier. And I'll, I'll kind of go through a few examples later uh, where people want to you know, be able to access other areas of the network or an area of the network goes live that you don't know about. So you've got a small branch office somewhere um, that's in a, well, we put them here when we've got works going on. They're building a new underground station in London. Um, they'll put in a load of porter cabins that people will be working in and they'll put in a temporary internet connection so they can connect back to the office or a network connection so they can connect back. Something goes wrong. Some guys goes down to the local hardware store um, PC world for us, I guess for you guys, that'll probably be Best Buy. Um, someone will go and buy something from the store and install it and go, yeah, we're up and working again. And it's got default username and password and no one's ever going to make any changes because nobody knows about it and it never gets patched. Hurrah. So yeah, you can just get the idea where these devices come from and they sneak into the network. But a lot of people are like convinced that that is, they don't really know if that happens. Um, so, and again, keeping on that remote office. So this is where this is aimed at, is do device purchases have to be cleared by security personnel? 43% said yes. Um, the others probably should say yes, um, and they just aren't. Um, and we're, we're not talking about, you know, I need to go and install a, a new firewall. I'm not going to go out and buy a new checkpoint firewall with a support contract that I'm going to go and put in our corporate office tomorrow because I can't afford it, um, and I haven't got the budget for it. That will be the security guys who do that. What we're talking about here is like the remote offices. So those ones I'm talking about where it's in a porter cabin in the middle of nowhere, um, it's a temporary office and someone's going to install a printer. So they've just gone and bought a printer from Best Buy, um, an off-the-shelf router, some off-the-shelf Wi-Fi. Maybe um, there's two cabins either end of a building site. There's one guy in one, one guy in another. Um, they've installed one interconnect internet connection into one office but the other one hasn't got one they don't want to run a cable because it's a building site so what they do they buy a wireless extender or wireless access point and they connect the two up and hey they can both work from their separate separate cabins buildings offices um unfortunately they've just gone and put a stupidly big security hole in their network but there we go they can still do their work all good um so you just get the idea of where we're going for there is that's that you know rather than does everything have to be approved it's do those ad hoc purchases have to be approved? 
And the other one, this was um, one we threw in just as a, that'll be an interesting thing to know, is do you have a dedicated guest Wi-Fi? 23% um, of people actually um, not sure or didn't have a guest Wi-Fi. I mean, some areas you, you don't need a guest network. You know, it's, you're not going to have one, end of story. But, you know, most people, you should know if there's a guest Wi-Fi or not. And it's just simple. This is more of a, um, a security awareness thing, is if you don't know there's a, the guest Wi-Fi, then if you have people come and visit you, how do you give them a Wi-Fi connection? And sometimes it'd just be, oh, you'll have to use your phone. We don't have one, sorry. Um, but it just those people who don't know, it always worries me if, how many of those people are actually giving access to their network? Because, oh, here's our network password. You can just connect in and good luck, have fun. Don't break anything, um, which people invariably do. So, yeah, essentially, we can see that there, there's a lot of different things. People have a lot of objectives around or opinions of, of wireless networks, but there's a lot of things they don't know, and they're quite happy to admit they don't know. Um, and you know, the thing I said, asset and device visibility is critical to wireless networks. Uh, we could see from these statistics here, you know, the, the three different the 61%, not 67%, um, are not confident they could prevent wireless. Um, half uh, don't know what's connected to their network. And those people who think they should do more to actually connect. So the, based on those stats, you know, um, you look at the modern enterprise challenges. So you look at that information, you know, we don't know what's on our network. And if you couple this then with this, so, you know, if, for us as security guys, what are, what are our challenges in work? You know, there's increased access, <laughs> particularly now, funnily enough. Um, an example I always use that's um, quite relevant now is I was talking to a customer quite early. Um, so in the UK, it was back in um, April time that we went into a nice lockdown and everything shut down and you couldn't leave your house. Um, great for me if you live in the country, pretty sucky if you live in an apartment in London, but there we go, I don't, I'm lucky. Um, but this this one particular company I was talking to, they had 800 home workers, so people who could work from home. They worked in some confidential stuff, so they couldn't work from home. Um, government comes out and says, oh, lockdown, only travel to work if you simply must travel. They'll, you know, We're going to reduce public transport. There's going to be a lot of problems. You need to stay at home. Suddenly, their workforce went from this 800 to 20,000 home workers overnight. So they had the VPN capacity. They'd already kind of foreseen these things. Part of their business continuity plan is they had VPN access for everybody. So they knew every employee could work from home and have this VPN access. But to go from 800 to 20,000 overnight, yeah, I'm glad it wasn't me. Um, so increased access, um, you know, people are putting services in the cloud. It's, but again, particularly now, you, you can't, it's not so easy to go and install a new server, a new rack of servers, some new storage, anything like that. So people are turning to cloud infrastructure um, without necessarily going through the right process to understand the cloud infrastructure. So, you know, cloud is great. I've never been a fan of the cloud, as you can tell from the, uh, the, the little one right here. I've never been a big fan of it. But, you know, it's adaptable. It's easy. It's, on, it's turn on and offable. You know, if you want to use it, you can use it. If you want to turn it on, you shut it down. It doesn't cost you any money. Um, so it's quite adaptable, but there's also a lot of risks if you don't really know what you're doing and you're just trying to solve a quick and dirty problem. So, yeah, if the cloud is great, but you have to know what you're doing before you before you go there. Um, and there's gaps in visibility. So, you know, we've increased our attack surface by going to the cloud, um, and we've also got gaps in our visibility. So things like TLS 1.3, it's good. It's good at encryption. And if you're one of those people who, or one of those companies who have to break that encryption, um, it's, it's expensive to, um, if not morally wrong. Um, and also quite, quite, yeah, quite difficult to do. Um, if, yeah, so you, you're kind of having to intercept the traffic, break it out, um, re-encrypt it. People generally know you've been doing that. Um, but it has that gap in visibility because particularly over in Europe, you can't do that it's, well. They don't admit to doing it, but they probably do. Um, but yeah, you do tend not to break in. You know, and the stronger the encryption, the, the more of a gap in that visibility there is. You can't see everything that's going on within the infrastructure as well. So I want to give an example of why that visibility is quite important. So I'm. this is all, thankfully, before lockdown when we actually had a few client networks in our, in our region. So um, I mentioned I work in Plymouth in the UK. Um, so Outpost 24, we've got an office in Plymouth. 
great. You'd expect that. Um, there's eight, nine of us work there. We are, we're, we're gadget freaks, a lot of stuff, laptop each and a phone. Um, so we live, we, our office, so we don't live there, although it feels like it at times. Um, our office is by the river. There's a nice river here and the sea is literally right here. So we're in the middle of a business park. There's not really that much around us. So you know, we're not, um, surrounded by other tech companies, you know, over here, they distribute fertilizer of all the great things here. There's gas storage and over here, they provide gas as well. They have gas storage on oh, that's fuel. That's the fuel depot. So, you know, quite an explosive mixture to live around there. Um, but we have a river, we have the sea, you know, it's, it's quite in the middle of nowhere. Um, but this is our normal network footprints. This is our wireless footprint that we see, um, around our office. So, um, you can see the, the access points here. So there's a 2.4 and a five gig for each one of these. Um, so that they're, they're here and there's all the different companies around and all these, um, different clients that are hanging around are not actually connected to an access point. And think of all this as just being, you know, this is not in the middle of a city. It's very far from being in a city. It's in, in the middle of nowhere, but we're still seeing all this wireless, wireless devices. So I'm going to use our own network as an example, because if you're going to throw someone under the bus, use yourself. And I am the perfect example. Well, you can see here, we have a couple of different networks that we've got set up guest network, our client network, and uh, an internal network. Different horses, different courses, different people work on different things, depending which part of the company you're on. You know, they're not that much different, really, apart from the, the guest network. And they're not confidential, because you can go and stand outside our office and see exactly what they're called, because they broadcast themselves out, which is great. Um, but you can also see this little red dot. That little red dot is me. I'm bad. I'm a bad person. Um, but I'm, I'm connected to the, the guest network here. But I'm red. Why, why am I red? Why is, why is that bad? So you can see here that everyone has connected to you know, a different network. So these are all the connect the networks that these people are connected to. These devices, 2.4 and 5 gig guest network, you know, fine. Um, these devices here, client network, 2.4, 5 gig, fine. This one red net device here connected to the guest network. And he's been connected to the client network and he's been connected to the internal network. And because he's red, he's been connected to at least two of them at the same time. So he's a very naughty boy. Um, essentially, this is telling me that I've done bad stuff. So this, this kind, and it's all about and I'm going to that visibility side. If you can't see that somebody's done bad things, you never know that they've broken that policy. We can have security policies coming out of our ears, but if we don't know um, and don't have that visibility that somebody can break them, then yeah, we never know. Um, so just an example, I can just see here the connected on corporate network, corporate client connects on the guest network. I now know that I've broken that policy. So it's all about that visibility and not having that visibility. Um, and just, just some examples of, you know, again, visibility. Um, the Hack 5 Pineapple that I definitely don't own um, that sits around in the office just causing trouble. Um, the unencrypted access point that I definitely haven't got that's definitely not connected to that pineapple that definitely doesn't pay Rick Astley's never going to give you up every time someone connects to it. Sorry if you ever have. Um, but yeah, it just gives you an example of the, the things that can be hanging around and they'll just be there. Um, and the one fun thing is I was just sat there looking around, um, thought, oh, I'm going to send some, some alerts for drones because you know, I've got a drone. I fly my drone around the country and I, fly into trees and things and nearly crashed in the sea a few times. Let's have a look, see if there's anything around. Nothing, left the alert on. And then every day I'd see um, a drone appear by the office sometime in the afternoon, but I'd never heard it. Um, and every day I was hearing the same drone and I'm like, oh, sorry, seeing the same alert, say there's a drone. And one day I looked out the right window and it turns out because of where we are on the river, um, they were sending the fishing boats out with people going out on stag do's, hen nights, now, they were going out, do some deep sea fishing, some wreck fishing, some shark fishing. Um, and one of the things that they did when they got on the boat was that the guy driving the boat would send up his drone, take some cool pictures of them and some video of them while they were leaving the harbor and going out to sea. And that was the drone I was picking up. So completely harmless. And also the fishermen have kind of embraced the technology to encourage people to go. But yeah, it, it's just uh, had I not known what it was, I might have got a bit suspicious about why there was a drone popping up every afternoon but i'd not actually seen it and i didn't know he was flying it but 
bit of enthusiastic. Um, so some common wireless security threats. So I've talked a lot about you know wireless and what people are worried about, but what are actually those those security threats? So some of the things you know people are talking about here. Um, you know they say they're checking their um, for malicious infections or known vulnerabilities by patching them. Um, and some of the th things, you know, again, it's slightly ignoring the password theft, although we'll get to that one first. Um, but these things like man in the middle attacks and uh, Wi-Fi spoofing, things like that, that people are worried about. So this one's a great example um, of a, a wireless attack, which is using a wireless keylogger, um, which you can see I bought from eBay. It was delivered from Poland um, back in November last year. It cost me a whole 13 pounds. I think that's about $15 today. Um, and it's tiny, and I can put it on the end of a wired keyboard because hopefully people are using either Bluetooth keyboards, mm, um, but not those funny little dongles that you get because you can break those and hijack those sessions, which is never a good thing. Um, but yes, you can plug this on the end of a wired keyboard, and it really does look like there's nothing there. It's tiny. Um, and what's even more great is it's running a wireless access point just using the power from the keyboard. Uh, or the USB power, sorry. It's running a wireless access point, and I can stand not too far away. It's about 100 meters. I could, um, 100, uh, it's 100 feet, um, so about 30 meters um, away from it. But I could still pick it up. Um, it was a bit slow, but it was only text I was getting. Um, but it was so easy to get. You know, I just went onto eBay, bought it. It was delivered. Um, if I knew someone who worked in the office, I could just say, oh, I'll give you 20 quid if you can plug this into one of the keyboards for me. Um, most people would do that for the cleaner, you know, they would do that if you were nice. Um, it doesn't, doesn't show up, but it's range was, yeah, pretty limited and you do need that physical access, but it just goes to show how simple these things are to actually buy and acquire and use. Um, and it could take 16 meg of data and in turn text terms, that's quite a lot of data. Um, that's a lot of passwords as well. Um, unauthorized access points. So that's always an important one. I'm sure we all, um, Know what these are but just to say that yeah you've got a, an unauthorized access point here invariably if someone's put something on that shouldn't be there um they're in a default configuration no one's actually changed anything so they've just plugged it in um and it's it's working straight away so why should anyone change anything but it's yeah the admin password password login nearly always works um the encryption is nearly always the most basic like um wpa or something like that or not even wpa the one before that um but yeah the encryption is using the minimal and yeah it offers i mean the number of times i've been pen testing and we've gone like uh there's a net gear here i wonder what the password is would it be net gear net gear oh uh, yeah and suddenly you're in on a wireless device that's connected to support the printer um or the photocopier or at one point the atm machine so that was a worrying one when we found that one but yeah they do exist and that's kind of yeah usually used for easy access points um the evil twin access point. This is always one of my favorites. Um, and it's one we've used sig significant success, which is good. So you know, you've got an SSID, Acme Wireless, okay? So our SSID, um, right, get the right screen with my mouse, um, is down here. So we've got this Acme Wireless um, access point. I'll tell you what's even easier. Now I've learned how to do this. So we've got this Acme Wireless here. Um, we've got this one here, which is our, our safe, corporate network which you know, i'm at the wrong end of the building it's got a pretty weak wireless signal um and then i've got my own homemade um wireless access point here um which is not actually really an access point it's actually a laptop pretending to be a, an access point so i've got my wireless my corporate one here everyone's fine bit of a weak signal and then i come along stop broadcasting out and say do you know what i'm acme wireless and i've got a better signal than you um my laptop is going to go have you really well i've got this password for you and i'll be like yeah okay that's a good password come on in what will happen is i will then take all your traffic you will join me i will steal all your traffic and have a look at what you're doing and then take all the bits best bits out of it and then i'll just send you back on your way to the way you were coming originally so you would never actually know that anyone's been tampering with the data you know, sometimes things will be like oh things are a bit slow nothing seems to be working right today um, you know, I can't actually access Facebook or the BBC or something because you know any any person doing this worth their salt is just like, well, if you're looking at Facebook, I'm not going to bother rerouting your signal. It's a waste of my bandwidth because I'm running off the uh, the phone wires here. Um, 
so yeah now these days with 5g and 4g it's not such a problem but yeah back in the day when we were doing this using 3g networks or 2g networks it was actually um, a little bit more difficult and a little bit slower but essentially you're stealing the data from someone who thinks they're connected to their corporate wireless but actually they're not they're connected to you um so it's it's a really good it works so well um and it's really successful and it, you know nine, nine times out of ten people don't actually know that something bad has happened in the process as well which is even better so how can you improve your threat detection you know it's always i'm telling you all these bad things how can you improve it so one of the biggest biggest problems has always been who's responsible for monitoring the airspace so um you look at the network team and they're like yeah i've spent all this money on this wireless equipment great it's awesome you know, we, we've got cisco we've got um aruba it's brilliant great can i have access to it so i can look at the bad things no that's ours oh but no no network team look after the wireless sorry okay um or is it, you know so the network team are like well we we provide the infrastructure the security of it we've followed what your rules say they must be this this encryption level um we've got mac filtering that we're taking out of the, the active directory for the mac addresses you know it's awesome um but still the security team don't have that visibility. Um, is it the security team for monitoring the airspace? You know, they've got all these great tools with the network team, but you know, they can't get access to them because the security, the network team, like, well, they're our tools, our login. We don't want you to change anything. If we give you a login, you can change things. And we don't want that. So you can't have it. You have to get your own stuff and, uh, you know, budgets, things like that. It never happens. And essentially, it turns out as a, a not my job problem. Yeah, the security guy's like, well, I'd like to, but I haven't got the equipment. And the network guy's like, I've got the equipment, but it's not my job. Um, I'm not picking on security guys here because I used to be one. But yeah, I do find when the security guys want to get something from the network guys, sometimes there's a bit of, well, you know, I'm not allowed on your firewalls. You're not allowed on my network. They have different things. So you can often find there's that not my job problem. So just as an, an example of why why this can be bad, um, I want to kind of introduce Brian. So Brian, Brian's a nerd. He likes Nerf guns. Um, he likes Nintendo light guns by the looks of it. Um, he's got a pretty awesome standing desk and some nice 4K monitors. Yeah, he likes his sci-fi stuff and his wireless boxes. Um, and why Brian's a nerd. He spent years saving up for this desk in the office. Yeah, he, he's got the coolest desk out. Everyone's really jealous of him. Um, Brian likes where he works. Brian's been put on assignment in the mailroom. Not because he's doing mail, but he's doing some work down in the mailroom and he doesn't want to. Um, he's installing some things, he's fixing some things, you know, they've had some problems down there. He's installing some new stuff down there and he's got to bring it up to date because the, the IT equipment in the mailroom is pretty old. Unfortunately, he works in the mailroom with Steve. He doesn't like Steve. Steve's the kind of guy who wants to go and watch the ball game down at the pub on a Friday. Um, Brian wants to play World of Warcraft. You know, we all know Brian. We all are Brian. Well, I am anyway. Um, not with World of Warcraft, though. It's, it's not my thing. Um, but he doesn't really want to mix with these people. He wants to be up in his desk, in his little domain, because he's happy there. So, yeah, he wants to get rid of these people. So what does he do? He's like, well, I know. If I install this wireless access point here, I can go upstairs. I can do all my work from my desk quite happily by connecting into that wireless access point. He wouldn't be in the mailroom, he'd be working from home. So it's not all bad. Um, but yeah, Brian's not a, not a happy person. So he puts in that wireless access point to let him go, to let him work from where he wants. Brian, Brian's a big problem. Brian is causing a lot of problems. Um, Almost nobody knows Brian is a problem because he's a nice guy. He just wants to get his job done. He's an efficient worker, just there to get his work done. Um, but he, no one thinks he'd do anything bad. He doesn't do anything bad. He's not malicious, but he knows he's a problem. But so does the guy outside who wants to also get at that data in the mailroom, who also wants to get at that data on your network because Brian's just made his job easier. But this guy is like, huh, now I've got all these things to play with. Um, and that this is, you know, it's a scenario and it sounds silly. It's a stupid way of putting it across, but it's a scenario I found so many times, particularly when we've been pen testing. Um, you see that, you know, it's a net, it's always a net gear. I don't know why it's not Linksys. 
um, it's always a Netgear wireless access point. They must be really easy to get hold of um, that you find that is tucked away somewhere because somebody wants to be able to access something easier. And yeah, it, it sounds silly, but it's it happens still and it happens far too often. But that's okay because you're not got a problem. You have a wireless audit, right? So as an example, I'm going to say PCI because those of you who have ever dealt with PCI know how I'm you know, you know how glorious it is to have to deal with PCI, um, and, but it's a good it's a good standard to follow. It's not you know, don't adhere to it to the letter. You have to go over and above, but for a base point, it's a good standard to follow. Now, one of the things it says is to implement processes to test for the presence of wireless access points. So yes, we're gonna we're gonna implement something to test for wireless access points. Great, that's good. Um, Part of that is you need to detect and identify all authorized and unauthorized wireless access points. Oh, okay, yeah, we can do that. We know how to do that. Um, on a quarterly basis. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, what? Uh, that that's that's like every three months. So if Brian had been there for three months, you might have caught him. But if someone's being a bit more facetious and is doing it for like two months. Um, you never would have seen it. Somebody wants to go in, stores a wireless access point, does something bad, um, leaves again, you never would have seen it. Someone goes in and stores a key log and never would have seen it. You know, it's it's all stuff that you wouldn't actually normally see. Um, you know, and even we go back to these, I, know I haven't mentioned them for a while, these IoT devices. So uh, there's only one office I've ever been to in London that was controlled by Nest thermostats. Um, and it was new and they had no end of problems. But you know, all of those have got wireless on them. If someone decides that, oh, we're going to try this new thing, there's a new device in there you didn't know about that someone's put in that potentially could be leaking. You know, if it's got an open password, no one's ever connected to it, bad things could be happening because of that if it's never actually been configured properly. And that's half the thing is people don't actually configure things properly is half the, half the problem. So... One of the important things as part of that is building this monitoring to your workflow. How does it not become another job that I've got to take on? How does it not become another thing that I've got to do? Because we all have enough to do, right? Especially when we're working from home now. Um, yeah, if you haven't been in the office for a while, when first time you go in, you're going to have a lot of stuff to do. And even right now, you know, working from home, it, it's quite easy to actually forget that you need to stop working at the end of the day because people get grumpy with you you're still working at seven o'clock in the evening um, and you've forgotten to leave um people get angry so how can you build that into that monitoring in your workflow so back back into this who is responsible for monitoring the airspace and people going it's not my job the first the first part and this the first step onto it is actually understanding the airspace rather than you know oh it's it's just like another network right so i'm gonna is to put all these on i hate PowerPoint, things like that. Um, so essentially, you start off with raw data. So it's always right at the beginning when you start monitoring these things, you get so much stuff, so much data, you don't know what to do with it. It's like, uh, it's a pain in the neck. I don't know to do all, all this stuff. Well, first thing is to start with that raw data and classify and normalize it. You know, what do you expect to see? I expect to see my corporate wireless access points. I expect to see the wireless access points of the businesses around me. They're the kind of normal things I like to see. Um, and move turns out into meaningful data. You know, I can see these things. I know I expect to see them. Um, and then over time, begin to correlate that with what you found. Um, so identify anomalies, risks, things that, you know, and my, I, I kind of keep them open as anomalies and risks because what I see as an anomaly as risk is different to what the guy over there sees as an anomaly and risk. And the guy over there sees an anomaly and risk. Everybody's perception is different. They're all based on what their business needs are what their business understands. So, you know, for a bank, the risk is far different from a law firm. For a law firm, the risks are far different from a retail establishment. So it's all about correlating what you have um, with what you believe to be anomalies and risks. So it's all around what the business is. Um, alerts, you know, it's, it's great having all this data, um, but if needed, if something goes outside of the normal, um, get alerting for it, find out what's actually happening and get some sort of correlation going on those alerts. So um, another example I always give for alerts is I was always seeing um, every night from our office at about 4 a.m. Well, it's usually that between 2 and 4 a.m. It was a bit of a window. 
um, I would see Android AP would always appear. So it was an access point would always appear, which is not normal for an access point to appear. And it was called an Android AP. And it was like, well, that's strange. Now, why would that appear between two and four o'clock and then disappear like 20 minutes later? And it was consistently 20 minutes disappear. So I was working really, really, really late one night. Um, I was in the office, all the lights were out, uh, almost all the lights were out. Um, and I was doing some work and kind of, 2.30 in the morning, a van pulls up, out comes a security guard. Um, and it was him. It was a security guard. And at that point, I got the alert. And it turns out when I went and spoke to him and scared him half to death because he wasn't expecting anyone to be in the office, which was quite funny. Um, but when I actually spoke to him, it turned out that his TomTom was a really old one, didn't have, so he wanted his sat-nav so he could plot his route for all the businesses he had to go check on and you know, get them done as quick as possible. Um, but he would connect that to his phone. So his phone was running an access point and it would connect to his phone and his phone would then update it, you know, if there were police speed cameras and that kind of thing. So it was all that just based on that one anomaly that I was getting of seeing this weird access point appearing every night between two and four, which is not a normal thing to happen. Um, had it been a client, I wouldn't have cared less, wouldn't have even noticed. But the fact it was an access point just means it's something that was out of the ordinary and something different. So so it's a silly again it's one of those silly stories but it's a good way of just pointing out that yeah looking for the anomalies looking for the things that's different is what's most important um now reporting we all have managers um we all have people we report to um and they all like pictures i'm always saying that the first rule of management is you love pictures it, it's how it works you know as soon as i become a manager one day maybe I'm going to love pictures. I want to see a visual because I've got loads of things to do. You know, I've got there's enough people reporting to your boss that they don't want everybody going with all these spreadsheets and everything. They want a picture. They want to be able to see, show me historical data, show me what's good, show me what's bad, and show me it quickly. Um, and that's essentially what you need to do is to have that, yeah, a visualization of what's good, what's bad, and what's changed. And, and it's kind of quite easy to do. And then continuous monitoring. I mean, it's it's one of those things I've said when I was talking about the um, the PCI thing, you know, once a quarter, it's not all about I do it four times a year, you know, great, look at your wireless four times a year. It should be constant. It's got to be a continuous because it's always changing. You know, people are coming in and out, um, especially now, you know, there's uh, a lot of offices that have a lot less people in them. Normally, the footfall through the offices is usually pretty high. You'd see a lot of devices. Um, so, you know, the bad ones were would stick out now there's less people in there so it's actually if you've got somebody sat around hanging around like oh they've not they've been there for a while why are they sitting there with their laptop um now it's like oh they just haven't been in the office for a while yeah they've probably not been in and they can't do much and they don't want to go up to the office it's dangerous and um, there's people there who might not wash their hands properly or aren't wearing masks they don't want to go up there um they're just going to sit down in the reception area with their laptop whereas actually they're a bad person so it, it's all about having that continuous monitoring to always be looking at that um, airspace and finding out what kind of bad things are in there. And that always brings me to the hamster wheel of death. So it's it's one of the things I always talk about. And uh, yes, our marketing people hate me with my picture of the hamster, um, Geraldine, the hamster. Um, but it's a process that um, kind of the assessment process. So obviously, we're a VM vendor, but we do pen testing. And you can take this to the AppSec side. You can take this to the cloud side. Um, any type of security assessment is based on three phases and three phases alone. Now, you can have um, what I had previously where I've got these six phases. But actually, when you kind of crunch that down, um, the three phases that are most important is identifying what you own to so know what it is, find out where, it where it's weak, and then risk reduce the risk on those weak areas once you've reduced that risk find out what you own find out where it's weak reduce that risk it's it's a hamster wheel of death you're never getting out once you're in it geraldine is going to lose all her weight and die in there um it's just a never-ending process it's not one of these things that you can say well we've been doing it for six months uh, we're good we're good now we've passed all our accreditations we can forget about that for a while it's a constant process of knowing what you own um, and finding the thing, should should that ring doorbell be on there? Should that um, security cameras that you've never heard of before be on there? Should these weird 
things that you've never seen before with Chinese characters in there be on the network. Um, and you usually find out it's somebody with a, an Android phone of unknown origin. Um, is it the, the, the things that look the most suspicious and often they're harmless. Um, but often, you know, it's the things that don't look suspicious but have never been seen before that are usually the problem. So, yeah, it's just a constant process of identifying, assessing, and focusing that risk reduction. Um, and it's, it's about reacting in the right, right way as well. So, um, yeah, you've got, you want to get a complete picture of all your devices, what you have. So, you know, we can see here we've got all sorts of devices. Um, I can see, yeah, just some Wi Fi drones, phones. Um, whether it's medical, telephones, yeah, all these things, depending on your environment. So, and again, it, it's a very, I go back to that where I said at the beginning, it's the business side of things because everybody's business is different. Um, my idea of what should be in my environment, I those Raspberry Pis that I'm used to scroll messages about the temperature in the office and whether I'm in the office or flying, which I can't do anymore. Um, you know, those things, are they normal? Well, in our office on our guest network, yeah, they're pretty normal. Um, if it's a medical device on our corporate network, well, that's going to stand out like a sore thumb. So the network camera on our corporate network, again, stands out like a sore thumb, shouldn't be there. So it's all about getting a picture of what you have. Um, recognition and baseline, you know, find out what those things are. Are they critical systems? Um, is it something, you know, around your security posture? Is it a firewall? You know, I, I, I point them out slightly differently. So this is about what that pipe thing is to your business. So critical systems, things to keep the business going, things for security posture, and that's even like door control systems and things like that. Has it got a business role? So is it something that's like um, you know, your CRM system or your ServiceNow system or something like that that's that's got to be there? It's got a good role in the business. Or is it something you're like, why? What's that doing now? I don't know what that is. Why Why is that there? Um, even, you know, my air purifier that's sat next to me here and making weird noises right now, and I'm not sure why. Um, even that, I get alerts on my phone to tell me that you know, the air is of a different, not right. It connects via Wi-Fi, um, which is always strange. But you know, is that a normal thing for in my house? Yes. If it was in my office, no. So, yeah, the, the idea of a malicious and a rogue device always depends on the environment that it's in. Um, there should always be an element of of monitoring as well. So critical system monitoring and threat analytics, which is a really posh word of way of saying, look what you know and draw pictures. Um, so know what's there, what's critical, what's important to the business. If I know that someone's attacking some certain infrastructure for us, that's bad. Or if there's something anomalous happening there, that's bad. If I see something weird going from one of my Raspberry Pis, I just turn it off. It's already me being an idiot, but it's all about knowing what are the systems that are important to watch and looking at the doing the threat analytics to say, well, is that a threat or is it just bad traffic or is it common traffic that's just not doing the right thing? Um, and it's knowing how to respond. So it's whether you just report on it, alert on it, or something you need to fix. So there's there's three ways you kind of generally work with most things is if you put a nice report and at the end of the month, so those things you don't care about so much, you report on at the end of the month. Those things you care about more, like that weird Android AP, I get an alert and I know it's something I've got to do something about or look further into. And the other end is just remediation. Do I need to fix it? Yes or no. If I need to fix it, then I should fix it. If I don't, then I'm probably not going to fix it. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff in there. Um, and it's all about, you know, putting that risk into to that risk of your wireless devices in a business context, which I know yeah, it may not be the most technical thing in the world, but it's important that we all need that business to keep our, keep our jobs, right? So just some important things to take away, some points, um, and also some Swedish ice cream, because there's, there's one thing that they do really well in Sweden, it's ice cream. They have a lot of ice and cream. It's really good. Um, and I just wish I could go there this year for one, but I'm going to miss out. So um, instead, I'll have some other takeaways. Um, wireless network confidence is still... You know, a little bit behind. People aren't so confident in the wireless airspace as they are about their physical network, about their wires and things like the wires and cables that we all love. Um, they're the same threats. Nothing's changed. It's just in a different attack surface. You know, they're the same sort of, can I steal your passwords? Can I get some malware here? But instead of being over the cables, it's over a wireless network. You know, it's the same things, the same problems. It's just a different attack surface. 
Um, you can only protect yourself from what you know about. Um, if you don't know about something, you can't protect yourself about it. So, yeah, it's all, the whole idea is knowing what you own, knowing what's bad, what's good, um, what presents a risk, what doesn't, and being able to protect yourself from any potential threat and perceived threat around around that. Um, oh, there we go. And um, building into your existing workflow is actually really simple. Yeah, a lot of people think, oh, you know, it's a whole new thing. I've got to add all this into my my workflow. I've got to add all this new things in. Actually, it's really, really, really simple. Um, it's not a difficult thing to add in. You know, I've managed to build into my security workflow, the wireless monitoring and the alerting. Yeah, I do that every day now. Even while I'm sat here, I sit, well, not right now, um, but while I'm sat at home, I'm sitting there, I can still monitor the airspace around the office. I still see the odd occasional thing, but I haven't seen any drones for a while. I haven't seen any um, security guards going past, which I guess is not not allowed to work right now, but there we go. Um, so it's, it's really simple to build that into your existing workflow and just make sure that everything is as you expect it. So that's me. Um, thank you very much, everyone. If you've got any uh, questions, I believe there is a method for you to ask the questions of me. Hey, John. Scott here. Hey, Scott. Hey, I appreciate uh, you presenting. Um, I do have a couple comments. I Unfortunately, I can't get to the Slack channel, so I apologize. Um, yeah, and, no and a side note, if you rewatch this presentation, you're going to know something funny. Apparently, don't let your cats walk on the desk while you're live presenting on YouTube because it's hard <laughs> to fix. Uh, oh. Disconnected us, not the audio part, um, but something got gets connected. So you're going to notice a little blip in there. Uh, oops, I got us reconnected. I don't think it interfered with your presentation. And then I just kind of left everything on the screen. And I was <laughs> like, well, uh, if I do all this, it can just kind of distract the viewer. But I hope you guys enjoyed this. A, a couple of comments uh, that I did have for your presentation. Yeah, sure. Um, ag agreed. I think that was a good decision not to broadcast uh, at the conference uh, to those TVs that were wireless. I think that was <laughs> yeah. good call there. Yeah, my, my choice of videos may have been a bit silly for everyone's liking. Yes, I think cybersecurity is one of those things where you have great, uh, a great power and great capabilities, but you have to go, comes with this good responsibility and when knowing what you could do, but you don't follow through with. Yeah, so that's it, good. It's, it's the willpower to know that you can and just be able to talk about it rather than actually have to prove your point. Yes, yes. And the, um, the courage in your convictions, you know it's going to work. Exactly. You, you just know it's going to work. Um, I'm going to have to hit up eBay. I think those polling key loggers look awesome. I think I might try one myself, see what your 30 pounds translates over here in American dollars. But I, I, but I think, You've uh, got some shipping from Poland, I expect. But uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. They work pretty well, put it that way. Yes. Yeah. Now, there's a question I do have. So you brought up about who's not my job. I like your network responsibilities. They have all the cool tech in the network piece of it. Yep. They're going to have all those tools. They even have the skill sets to run those, those wire sharks and traces. And the security engineers uh, over here are like, hey, I would love to get insight to your tool and be able to see some of this. And network guys are usually like, nah, you're kind of stepping over what my <laughs> job is. And, oh, yeah. and what are what are your suggestions when you have teams? How do how do network engineers partner with security? And and is it the case where network engineers are realizing they're part of security? It may not be in their title, but then they need to relay the information. They're not, security guys aren't looking for mistakes, right? They're not looking for mis, yeah. well, they are looking for misconfigurations. Um, <laughs> They're not looking to point fingers at people who make them. Right, right. I mean, that's, yeah. What are your suggestions regarding that? How do you build these teams with system administrators, Linux administrators, it, building and working with, with the engineers uh, to cooperate together, realizing it's, it's everyone's responsibility to protect the environment? So that, that's a great question because I had exactly this problem, a previous role. That was one of those things that we were just like, well, you know, we're the security team. And we also were lucky that we shared an office with a network team as well. And we all got on really well. And so we had similar monitoring systems. Um, and it was great because we had a good information sharing going on. But if I went up to, say, the mid-range or the, um, yeah, the, the Wintel guys and said, here's a vulnerability report. Here's all your bad stuff. You need to fix that. And I'm going to raise change records for all of it man, I wouldn't have safely got out of that car park at the end of the day. You know, I found that out once and I never did it again. Um, so it's, it's all about, you know, working together. It's, it's, it's kind of, you know, what can, what can you offer them that they can offer and what can they offer you? So 
yeah, I say, hey, guys, I've got this great, you know, we're looking at these tools. You know, we're seeing this traffic come in and it's coming from this area. What do you think it can be? Try and get them interested. Try And that was always the way we found was once you start getting people interested in what you as a security team doing, they start realizing that you're not those guys who sit in an office and no one's allowed to talk to you because you're doing super secret stuff. It's just about, I mean, there's stuff you can't show them, but it's all about showing them, you know, we're seeing things that maybe your servers are causing. They're sending out all this traffic and we think it's a bad thing, um, but put it in a far nicer way. Um, or maybe, you know, can you, can you help us with this? Can you, you know, we're trying to work out how we can get this routing working or we want to separate out the traffic from this. And once we found that we had that kind of mutually beneficial relationship, instead of it being them and us, then yes, it's, it started to be a bit, well, actually we've got a tool that can help you. And suddenly the network guys would be like, oh yeah, you can come and use our flute network tool anytime you like. And they were offering up their tools and yeah, this is 10 years ago. So, you know, <laughs> it wasn't all the cool tech we've got now. Um, but yeah, it, it suddenly went from, we've got this stuff. We've got this stuff too. Well, actually, how can we start working together? And by the time I left the company, the network team and the security team were one team. They'd just decided that actually we spent so much time working together and we had so many common goals and common aims that actually, yeah, when you think about it, a firewall is just a really intelligent router with extra stuff in it. So yeah, we ended up being the same team. And then it was uh, working with the Intel guys and working with the mid range guys. And then they'd start working. Well, you know, we've got this environment here where we're hosting all the web servers and you know, we're a little bit concerned about some of the ways people are accessing it, anything you security guys can do. And then suddenly we can't, but the network guys can. And then, you know, the next thing out it's uh, beers and curry for the evening. You know, it's, it's yeah. one of those things that you find that once you start working together as a team and start offering, you know, and it's sometimes it's a case if I offer up some of the stuff we can do, then they'll start offering up some of the stuff they can do. And before you know it, we're all friends, maybe. Yeah, that's good. So I, I like your, your diagram of, of Brian's desk and his 4K monitors that he had in the standing desk. What we're finding, though, is, is people are able to go back to the office. They ended up having 4K monitors at home, but they don't have them in the office. So the graininess, uh, the monitors are not as high quality. So we're getting the opposite where our equipment is being, well, it's not as, as savvy as their home stuff. But I thought that was funny on that diagram with Brian's desk. And, and that's always been the bring your own device problem yeah. is like, my iPhone, I generally, it's not anymore, not since I had kids, but I always used to, Apple announced a new iPhone. I'd get the new iPhone. My work iPhone was always four or five years out of date, you know, three or four years out of date. But my one was always the latest and greatest. So the company's buying me this piece of rubbish tech that I'm carrying around. And I've got all this latest and greatest shiny stuff. I'm like, well, can't I just do my email on my own phone? And it makes it so much easier. And that's that's that slippery bring your own devices then why should the company pay out a thousand pounds every three years for something that you really despise using? Yeah, exactly. Maybe and what you've got is help. way better. Yeah, and that, yeah. That's, that's that slippery slope. That is a slippery slope. And lastly, on the hamster wheel, um, I was thinking about the hamster wheel and I agree. It, it, and to, to comment on that, I think the hamster wheel, it, it's this constant continuous improvement. And at some point I always find when you identify what you own, the instant the hamster wheel doesn't get as soon as you find out what you've identified, what you own, and since it just gets bigger and all of a sudden you've introduced new risks and you're like, I didn't know about the video conferencing group was running this type of kind of video uh, conference. that had these ports yeah. and was running these th the streams in the environment, um, setting up their, uh, also their internet of things so they could run and host meetings. So I found that that hamster wheel, it, it also grows in size depending on what you discover in your environment based on the assets you have. Yeah, and as soon as you found that video conferencing thing, that's that's suddenly your focus. You're like, right, we're going to secure this, and it's in every building. So suddenly you've got to secure it in every building, and that's great. I've done that. That's secure. Yeah. Six months later, it's all patched. It's all up to date. It's in the patching process. Everything's working really well. And you're like, oh, man, they've just installed a new Teams infrastructure, which is now tying into that, and no one's patching that. And suddenly it grows a little bit bigger, and... Yeah, and then you forget about that, and then someone's installed something new, and yeah, and it, it just that hamster wheel grows and it swallows you up. It's painful, but it's, it's funny. Yeah, it's the modern world we live in. 
Yeah, it, it really is. You were a pen tester, so you would know this. Um, maybe at Outpost 24, you run across this. A lot of times people will hire pen testers and say, hey, figure out our rogue wireless devices. But then the pen testers come and they scan, but they're not necessarily looking at wireless printers. They're not looking at some of these devices or even the refrigerators. They're not even going in the kitchen rooms. What do you recommend for people in writing pen tests for third parties to do in their environment, looking for wireless rogue devices? A lot of times so, it's almost, how would you write that so that you're picking up these things that people are bringing in or the corporation already has these TV monitors set up? Yeah. So one of the big challenges we always had is that you'd go into like as a pen tester, you'd like in four weeks in a month through four different corporate environments, you know, it's, it's, you don't get to know an environment well. Um, and, and it's all about going into an environment and suddenly like, right, we need a wireless audit. It's like, great. What's your wireless network called? What's your corporate network? So we at least know what your corporate network is called. It's this. Oh, okay. Oh, and we've got this get nest, guest network. Okay. Right. Okay. So you've got those and you know what their corporate networks are. And then as the week progresses, they're like, oh yeah, oh, we forgot about this one. And we forgot about this. And you find actually there's not just one or two corporate networks. There's these other things. Um, and then you're kind of, you're really concentrating on, oh, we found this, it's a massive risk. You know, this TV is running this firmware and it's in, in the bit, oh yeah, that's the key people who work upstairs. That's not ours. It's like, well, it's really tough um, <laughs> because you've got a really short amount of time to try and learn something that somebody's been learning about for like three, four years. Um, so that's, I mean, that's why, you know, when we, we were kind of looking at the acquisition of the Pony Express stuff, one of the big things is we did was we talked to our professional services team who do all the pen testing now. And we were like, well, yeah, if you've got this in there and it's just spending a long time learning and constantly learning, does that make the job easier? And that, I mean, that was one of the big things for us was the wireless side of pen testing is so so changeable because you have to know the environment you have to know what's there um you know you can get a lot of time concentrating on something but you've got a big tower or of like 20 offices or a regis building where you've got 40 different companies in one office yeah it's you know how do you know what is a threat to that person and what isn't because you're looking at the wireless threats that you may not be able to identify what network they're connected on and it yeah, yeah. it's a really tough job it's it's a really hard thing which is why I kind of say that 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 once those four points in time is not a good way to do it because you know those four points you're getting four different people probably because most people have different you don't have the same guy come along every time if you do you've got a really good pen tester don't let go of them um but it's a different person being sent every time you're getting different information back and then suddenly you're like well one person found all these threats and this guy here he said oh you're pretty good you're pretty secure your wireless access points are running good with good encryption because his idea of what you wanted is you've got good encryption. Whereas the other guy is like, you've got all these threats, all these TVs, which are actually the offices around you. So yeah, it's all about having that constant, constant update of information. So you actually know what's going on. Yep. And one last commentary. I just thought about this too. And I think to your point, it's actually surprisingly very easy to do, but you, you the, it goes back to the Poland, uh, little wireless devices. Now, admittedly, the range isn't as good, but if you have a USB stick or, you know, something, it's amazing how you can just go on the street in downtown and you find someone on the street and you're like, hey, I'll give you 20 bucks if you just go into this, go up this, uh, this you know, staircase and try to find a door and just find the nearest conference room or computer and just plug it in. You'd be amazed. I, I, I've attempted to, to, to go and ask someone this $20, but it's amazing how much they're like, sure, where, where do you want me to go? And yeah. you're like, well, no, we don't want you to actually do it, but it, it's just want to see if you would. Yeah, you just need a little bit of physical security to to get past, which that th th would be them. And then from there, you, you've you've got infiltration in there. You know, if they don't have the proper network access yeah. controls. I mean, I did a physical security test in London. It was a shared building. I oh, know it wasn't a shared. This was an exclusive building. So it's one building for one company. Um, I spent a week working in there. Um, nobody challenged me. Spent week work and they didn't know once. So um, I ended up getting coffee and biscuits from the um, director's secretary because I was fixing the phones. So she thought before I sat in the director's conference room, she moved them to another meeting room so that I wasn't disturbed while I was fixing the phones. Um, but the best thing was that and this was actually a bit of a win for them was we left some, um, so me and the guys I was working with left some um, USB sticks around in the kitchens. 
uh, where people go and make their tea and coffee and make their lunch. And we left um, one in, there were four kitchens. We put a USB key in each one. Thought, right, each one had a bit of malware. It wasn't malicious, but it just meant we could gain access to an account because we were supposed to be doing that. Um, so someone sent around an email that said, has anybody left a secu- uh, USB key in the downstairs kitchen? Um, and then someone replies with, oh, there was one upstairs as well. And then someone else was, there was one in the top floor. And the next thing you know, the head of security was like, guys, can I just check? That was you, right? Wasn't it? That was you doing it. We're like, yeah, he was like, that wasn't very subtle. We were like, we're just trying our luck. We're like, but what happened to the other one? And someone did actually take the second one and plug it in. And <laughs> yeah, and they had domain, they were a domain admin, which made our lives even more fun. Um, they had a separate domain admin account. It just happened to have the same password as their actual account. So yeah, that was a fun one. It was one of those, uh, we should have been more subtle, but we won anyway. So what does it matter? Yeah, it's yeah. amazing, Harry. But uh, they it, were, it, it was good, though. It was good to see their reaction when suddenly they realized that there was the same USB key left on three different kitchens. Yeah, yeah they all look oh, the well. same here. What's going on? <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. <laughs> that, is, that is really good. Well, we're running out of time, but I appreciate your time. I appreciate you speaking here at our, our virtual event. And for those members that are watching, yeah. So I appreciate it very much. We hope to have you on at some point later, talking about different topics, maybe dive deep into to more how, how you detect and, and what you're looking for in logs. But I appreciate it. So with that, awesome. uh, our, yeah, so I appreciate it. Thank you. And we will uh, we'll say goodbye now on the end stream. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Cheers. Goodbye.